OK, so um, welcome everybody to this morning's reactor session. And today's session is DevOps, the non techie bits. And we're delighted to have um, Steve there with us this morning who will be delivering today's session. Steve is um, the DevOps Group co-founder, CTO and Microsoft Regional Director. So we're really delighted to have Steve with us and looking forward to the next hour session. Um, Please do get involved with this morning's session. Ask any questions you have throughout. There is a Q&A window that we'll be keeping an eye on for the next hour. Um, also, any feedback, comments you have, if you'd like to follow along, please do let us know too. Um, so really looking forward to hearing from everyone who's, who's joining us today as well. Um, just to give those of you a bit of background into the Reactor in case that you're not too familiar. So Reactors are um, community hubs for developer and startup groups to learn, connect and build. So what Reactors do is provide um, lots of presentations, hands on technical workshops um, hackathons, um, plus community groups and meetup groups that are all related to emerging technology trends. And reactors are physical event spaces where we would usually hold these types of sessions, um, but due to current circumstances, we're now holding everything online. Um, getting back to today's session, as I mentioned, it's an hour long. It will be recorded. I will post the link to the recording on the meetup group by the end of the week. OK, so without going any further, I'll hand over to Steve to get us started. Thank you very, very much. Um, OK, let's uh, let's get started with uh, DevOps, the uh, the non techie bits. Um, the, the genesis of this talk is really um, I've been to a lot of DevOps conferences and a lot of DevOps presentations and people often say start their talk talking something about DevOps is all about culture uh, and then proceed to spend the remaining 59 minutes of their talk talking about automation and technology. So um, we really wanted to sort of bring to the fore that that part of, of DevOps, which isn't technology related. Um, and we actually have our own model for DevOps adoption, which we call adaptive IT, because we think the one thing that IT and business needs to be in the modern economy is adaptable. It needs to be able to change doing the same thing for a long time just isn't really going to help you succeed anymore. You've got to be able to spot opportunities. So a little bit about me, my background. Um, I've been in IT for, for 30 years. I started in 1990 uh, as a uh, mainframe developer. Uh, and then after about four years of that, my attention deficit disorder um, kicked, kicked in and I couldn't handle being a developer anymore. So I started doing IT and local area network support um, starting back in the days of, um, of NetWare and then um, Land Manager. Uh, which then sort of became the, the, the Windows client server stack and they've pretty much done um, IT operations in client server and then moving into large scale high volume cloud. Um, Fat co-founded DevOps Group seven and a half years ago with a vision to make cloud and DevOps adoption fast, secure and simple. We do that by offering engineering, managed services, and consultancy around transformation and training via our DevOps Group Academy. Um, we are a Microsoft Gold partner, a Gold Cloud platform called DevOps, uh, as well as these other technology vendors. Uh, we're GitHub's only advanced services channel partner in the UK. Um, but uh, we tend to partner with organizations because we like their technology um, and we want to actually understand their roadmap and we want to go deeper and we want to get access to their uh, their roadmaps and stuff like that rather than um, uh, that we're doing it for any sort of pure commercial gain. So anything that you see on this list is technology we've used, we've trusted, you know, we've implemented for our customers. Well, I'm going to dive into a little bit about why DevOps. Um, a lot of the reasons DevOps transformation fails is because people skip over the why part of the conversation. Um, and that results in a lot of organization, a lot of people resisting the transformation, resisting the change because they go, hey, what's wrong with the way we're doing it? Uh, so it's really super important to um, uh, to explain the why and get people on board for that transformation. Um, then we're just going to go into the adaptive IT model, do a real DevOps uh, deep dive on the on the five pillars of adaptive IT. And if we've got any time, we'll uh, spend some time for Q&A. But um, the Q&A is available uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen in Teams, fire in your, uh, your questions whenever you can. So let's dive in. 
Why are organizations embracing DevOps? Uh, normally in the presentation, you would have a slide here, something insightful about digital transformation. You know, DevOps is eating the world. Every company is a software company. Um, you know, it's almost become a cliche now for people talking about the digital transformation. And I just wanted to make the point that that's really important, but it's, it is almost reached into the level of cliche now. What I think is a more important and a more insightful statistic is this statistic from McKinsey. Only 8% of company CEOs believe that their current business model will survive through digitization. So this is not, we have to tinker at the edge. This is 92% of companies saying, we have to make fundamental changes to our business model. Maybe we're moving from offline to online. Maybe we're moving to hybrid online, offline. Maybe we're completely getting rid of the services that we offer and using digital to offer a completely new set of services. Uh, ISVs are a great example. You know, they face a challenge of moving their software from you know, sending to, to you in an installer on a CD to, you know, maybe single tenant SaaS, maybe moving all the way to multi-tenant SaaS. And if you think about the capabilities they need to develop to, to provide a SaaS solution where you're doing 24 by seven support, where you're doing delivering updates, say on a, on a three week cadence like Azure DevOps does, compared to sending out, you know, one update a year in the case of many, many software vendors. Uh, you know, these are real fundamental changes to, you know, uh, how they gather their revenue, um, the, 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 the cycle of which they gather their revenue, how they spend their revenue in the split between dev and ops, for example. So look at this sort of this as the, as, as the journey, this pathway of digital transformation. What we tend to find is the organization, the, the business, and, and many, unfortunately, there seems to be this split between the business and IT. We talk about them as they're two different things, which we don't talk about the business and marketing and the business and finance and the business and HR as part of their two different things. But there's often this language inside IT. Oh yeah, the people in the business, like you're not part of the people in the business. And this is this gulf that we need to bring together, which is you know, a big part of the DevOps message is about breaking down these silos. But what we see as organizations that go on this digital transformation journey, they tend to start with trying to understand what does the customer want? So you see a lot of big data type applications. How do we get that insight into the customer needs? How has the customer needs changed due to changing demographics to the, the, you know, the increasing internet, the use of smartphones, all of these things that are driving the, the transformation towards a digital economy? Um, you know, the IT tends to go on a journey of tech modernization. You know, how do I adopt cloud? How do I adopt DevOps technology? How do I get rid of the technical debt and my legacy code? And the, the hope is that these two strands will join together. The business has got great insights about the customer. We've got this great new technology and we can come together to create innovative tech -centric, customer centric solutions that have brought the business and IT together to be a true digital business end to end from customer proposition to actual delivery of value. And, you know, what's key here is the growing understanding that um, that great software capabilities drives great business. Again, research from McKinsey, the developer velocity index survey um, research then found that, you know, that developer velocity um, drives business success. So what do they mean by developer velocity? Well, it was actually 46 separate factors across 13 core technology capabilities that I'll show you in a minute. But what it, um, so they created a weighted metric to give you this compound and developer velocity score. And then they compared that to the organization's business results. And what they found was organizations that had a high developer velocity score had four to five times faster revenue growth, 20% higher operating margins, 60% higher total return to shareholders, 55% more innovation. And that's comparing the top quartile to the bottom quartile. 
And, you know, that's sort of a clear indication that organizations that are great at software and by great at software, I'm including dev and ops in this calculation, because there's no point in having great software if you can't get it in the hands of your users and it's not up and it's not stable, it's not performant. You know, they had better business outcomes. And, and that's pretty stark, you know, there's, we'll talk about a bit more about this in a minute, but, you know, there is no doubt that organizations that are great at building great software are succeeding in a digital economy and delivering great returns to their shareholders. So let's have a quick drill down into the um, developer velocity, uh, developer velocity index and have a look at what the factors are. And what's super interesting here is technology, Okay, all those kind of great capabilities that you expect to see, but they also talk about working practices. How are you managing technical debt? How are you doing code reviews? How, what are your agile team practices, agile ceremonies definition of done? How are you using and adopting open source and bringing that into your organization as a working practice by the inner source adoption? And then they talked about organizational characteristics. You know, what's your team like in terms of its autonomy? How great are you at product management? What are you doing to recruit and retain great people in your organization? How are you doing your funding? How are you dealing with cultural aspects like psychological safety? So really, really interesting that the developer velocity is not just about technology. It's about working practices and about the organization. And when they looked at the um, um, the biggest drivers of those 46 factors, you know, what were those in the 13 areas? What, which areas were really driving uh, that great software? Um, well, quite interestingly, when we look at the highest factors, sort of see three key areas. One was the tooling, you know, tooling does make a difference. Having the right tooling uh, and the right platform for your success um, drove a lot of that, that business performance, had highest correlation with business performance. Um, but then the next two were the cu culture, that servant leadership, that cu culture of psychological safety, that willingness to collaborate and share, um, you know, psychological safety, I think it was almost uh, the actual, the single highest predictor or the single highest driver of the developer velocity index and therefore the, and the business success. And then the, the second highest area was talent management. You know, how are we making sure that the teams are healthy? How are we making sure that we are um, providing great career paths, et cetera, et cetera? So, you know, and if we, so having the right culture and attack your training is inspiring the right people, then we look at the DevOps research. So now we're coming at it from the DevOps side. And we look at the DevOps research done by in the State of DevOps report by um, DevOps um, um, Research Associates, DORA, as they're normally referred to. And they find that the, the elite performers compared to the low performers are deploying code 208 times more frequently with a one seventh the, the change failure rate. Uh, 106 times faster to go from code commit to that code running in production. And when they do have issues with stability in production, 2,604 times faster to recover from that, uh, from that outage because of the way they've automated these processes, because of they're focusing on smaller batch sizes, because of a whole bunch of different factors. But bringing that together, what you see is, is that the organizations that have adopted DevOps are twice as likely to exceed uh, their profitability, market share, and productivity goals. So, you know, it, it's really, again, as with the McKinsey, you know, DVI research, you know, organizations that can ship software quickly and have class leading stability in their production environments are twice as likely to achieve their business goals. So, you know, we've come at it from the, the McKinsey research, we've come at it from the DevOps research, um, and what we're seeing is the same thing. DevOps drives great software, great software drives great business outcomes. Okay, so what is and, and does it have a, a skew? Can I go and buy some DevOps? How can I get DevOps in a box? Uh, well, you can't, unfortunately. It's not something that you can buy off the shelf. It's a journey that you have to go on. It's a journey of transformation. It's a journey of discovery. Um, but 
you know, we can talk about the building blocks. Um, so let's just have a quick look at a definition of, of DevOps. Microsoft defines DevOps as the union of people, process and technology to enable the continuous delivery of value to customers. Uh, Nicole Forsgren, one of the co-authors of, um, of uh, the book Accelerate, which is a, a great book about DevOps, but also co-author of that uh, research, uh, the DORA research we talked about thing, you know, really drives this, this, um, this point home that we can deliver software with both speed and stability. We don't have to have a trade-off between these two things. This is the message of DevOps. We can have both. In fact, we can be class leading at both. Um, uh, when we look at the, the DORA research from the Accelerate book, you know, we can see that these organisations have that have adopted have less deployment pain they have less burnout in their teams they have higher staff satisfaction they um and, and whether they're greenfield or brownfield either a new startup organization or an organization that's had to train to transfer uh to transform to devops um you know it doesn't really impact this and you know we're getting the faster releases with both speed and stability so you know um, you know, employees in high performing organisations are 2.2 times as likely to recommend their organisation as a great place to work. So I think this is one of the things I really you know, want to emphasise. One of the, the most quotes I'm most proud of uh, as DevOps Group and as a co-founder of DevOps Group was um, uh, we we're working with one of our large customers in the insurance space. And one of my uh, delivery managers came to me and said, oh, I got this piece of feedback from one of our teams that we've been working on transforming them and stuff. And this person said, I'm enjoying the, well, the, the, the customer uh, that had told him the story, said, I'm enjoying coming to work for the first time in five years. You know, that, that's, that's having a real impact on people's lives. You know, that's, a, that's an amazing quote to hear that working in a more collaborative way, in a more autonomous way, having the right tools, uh, the right um, team, the right high trust organisation is, um, you know, is, is just an amazing thing to hear. Um, and I think it's something that we sometimes overlook that the importance of DevOps as a way of working that impacts and is suitable for, for, for 21st century digital organisations um, is absolutely key. Because historically, when we've looked at our, um, our organisations in traditional IT, we've kind of, kind of optimised by role. And, and what optimization by role means is, is that when somebody from the business, which again is seen as something, over there, the business comes along with an idea. They tend to come with a massive, huge batch of ideas, this massive overflowing shopping trolley. And then that'll be handed off to some kind of demand planning function. And there's going to be a queue of waiting up for when their project can be assessed and um, and decided whether this is the project that we want to do. We're throttling things there. And then we'll go into some sort of project management function to turn it into a project and get it up and running. And then it'll be handed over to another queue for the BAs who are going to then do the analysis. And then that analysis will be handed over to another queue of technical architects who will then look at the technical architects. There'll probably be some sort of user experience overlay in there now. Then it's going to be handed over to the development team. And then it's going to be handed over to another queue for the QA for the testing of the, uh, of the thing. Then at this point in time, it's probably the first time the sponsors have actually seen it. So the helicopter boss is going to come in and he's going to fly over the locker and he's going to, well, probably not like it. And he's going to throw in a whole bunch more requirements. And then we're going to have to go back to development again. Then we're probably going to go back and forth between this cycle between Dev and QA and Dev and QA and Dev and QA until eventually we run out of time because somebody way back then in the PMO committed to a launch date. So now we just have to ship this thing and we shove it into performance testing. And actually, performance is terrible. But, you know, we might have time to do a little another little bit of a cycle of some performance tweaks, but we're really up against it. So now we throw it over to the service delivery people. The service delivery people look at this and go, ah, you know, 
how do I, um, what am I going to do with this? Then then they sort of hand it over to operations and operations goes, what the hell? This, this new application uses MongoDB. We don't know anybody who knows MongoDB. How are we going to support this? But eventually, again, we've got that deadline ticking away. And so what happens is we hand it over to the customer. Now, all of these handovers, all of these queues, all of these queues have SLAs. Uh, in one large enterprise organization, we worked with the minimum period of time that this, this cycle could go through based on all of the SLAs for each individual team was 27 weeks. That's the best case scenario if each team met its SLA. So each team as a silo could pat themselves on the back and say, wow, we're doing a great job. We achieved our SLA, but they couldn't get an idea or a change from uh, from the start of the queue to running in production in less than 27 weeks. If they followed their process, they could get it in faster, but what they had to do was rip up all of their processes and have somebody ram it all through. Uh, what actually happened there that has a result of that obviously is, is that, you know, it skips some of the important checks and doesn't have the quality that it needs and then it becomes unstable and then you have this whole terrible negative cycle happening. So we've got a quick question here is, is, is DevOps essentially an extension to agile practice? Um, yes, um, it is. Um, uh, when we come onto our adaptive IT model, we'll make this more explicit, but um, agile, I think, enabled software development to get its act together and to start producing uh, shippable increments of software faster and then it hit this roadblock of operations and the the the, the problem with that was was that um, then ops became the bottleneck and i think a lot of the transformation on the ops side of devops came about because they were now the thing that was um blocking a lot of this innovation so um so What's the idea here is, is how do we optimize this by flow? Well, we adopt a lot of the ideas from, from Agile and Lean. You know, we have a very empowered project manager, the person there in the green, or sorry, a product owner, I should say, product manager. They then bring this into the team. They prioritize the backlog as part of the team. They then bring it into our sprint commitment. They bring that to a cross-functional team that has the testers, has the BAs, has the DevOps and or cloud engineers in that cross-functional team, a team that has the capabilities to build and run. And hopefully, because we've reduced more than half of all of these handovers, we will get this into the hands of the customer faster. The product manager can then say, hey, you know, we've got this for you now. What do you want next iteration? What do you want next cycle? Uh, and, you know, and maybe we've got some competing um, um, uh, business requirements here. If we are delivering on this steady, regular cadence, and by delivery, I mean fully tested, deployed into production, running in the right way with all the monitoring and all the metrics and all the stability we'd expect. Um, if we know that we are delivering on this two week cadence and somebody says, oh, well, I, I can't fit your work in this sprint cycle, but give me two weeks and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll fit it into the next release. It takes a lot of this pressure off. I mean, there's been some studies shown that um, a lot of project, big button, <clears throat> a lot of project managers spend over 70% of their time dealing with escalations, either escalations from their stakeholders to them saying, you know, where my project is, or escalations up to their line management to say, I need resources that um, they're in another silo, they're now the bottleneck, they're holding me up, can you go over there and yell at them and make them go faster? If we eliminate these silos, it's absolutely key that, that we can then uh, eliminate a lot of that wasted effort in chasing all of these escalations. So this all sounds pretty easy, right? Create cross-functional teams, throw a bit of agile on it, and it's all going to be brilliant. Um, yeah, um, it's a bit harder than that. In, in seven and a half years of running a DevOps and cloud company, uh, we found it's a bit more complicated than that. And we've developed our own framework, the Adaptive IT framework, to help organizations understand, give you a bit of a model of what needs to change. Now, this isn't a prescriptive capability model. Um, oh, sorry, actually, I'm going to talk 
very quickly, I'm going to talk about the, the grandfather model of, um, of, of DevOps, which is called CALMS. And uh, this was one of the first models. It's probably about it's probably about eight, seven or eight years old now. Um, and it's called CALMS, C-A-L-M-S, Culture, Automation, Lean IT, Measurement and Sharing. And you sometimes you'll hear it called CAMS, C-A-M-S. Um, but um, it's a very, very popular model. Um, you know, a culture of embracing change, leveraging the automation, eliminating waste and, and smaller batch size with lean IT, you know, re, re, strong focus on measurement um, and sharing. And when we wrote the, um, the syllabus for the, for the British Computer Society, um, we, we based this uh, around the CALMS model. And, and CALMS is, is really good, but it's a very good introductory level foundation. Um, but it didn't cover enough. Um, so it's, you know, we highly recommend that um, that uh, everybody does this foundation level sort of training to get you on the thing. And, but then for the people who are leading the transformation, we needed, uh, we needed a little bit more. Um, we needed something that gave a wider perspective for the people who are gonna be leading the transformation, which is where the adaptive IT framework came in. So let's drill in into adaptive IT. So, what have we got? We've got strategy, talks about working backwards from the customer, broken down into leadership objectives and metrics. We've got the organizational design. How do we move from project to product with an ecosystem of vendors, um, be a product aligned organization um, and really focus on creating high performance teams? You know, a lot of the key to creating high performance teams is, is this culture of, of unlocking the power of your people. It includes psychological safety, a commitment to continuous learning, and most importantly, uh, a management framework that allows autonomy at the team level in the, uh, in, in the how and what they achieve the, the goals that have been set. We talk about the, um, sorry. Joyce is presenting from home. You have to let your dog out so he just doesn't start woofing. Um, talk about ways of working. Um, this is big picture systems thinking. Again, bringing in the, the lean IT that we had in the CALMS model and then agile as one of those foundations of the ways of working. Um, and then we have um, uh, the technology pillar. So, in the the introduction to the uh, to, to the to the description of the talk, I talked about you know um, technology is really only twenty percent of the equation. There's five pillars, and the technology is only only one of them. Um, which is cloud, creating self service platforms, and leveraging all of the automation tools that we have available. You know, it is absolutely um, fundamental is to get the technology right, and there are massive challenges particularly with dealing with, you know, organizations that are still running Windows 2008, SQL 2008, in some cases, even going back to XP for certain core systems. There's a number of um, cancer systems in the NHS that control um, uh, cancer um, X-ray um, um, radiation therapy machines um, that still run on Windows XP. Um, you know, this is just beyond a shadow of a doubt, poor IT management on behalf of both the vendors of, the, of those machines and on the customers that buy those machines and aren't demanding the updates. So, you know, we can't miss the fact of, of technology, but technology always has to serve the business purpose and the way we, we um, define our strategy, the way we build an organization to deliver that strategy, the culture and about how we deliver it and the, how we actually do it from a ways of working perspective is more important than the technology. Right, so let's do, take a deep dive into each pillar and, uh, and, and, and have a look at what we've got. So, the strategy pillar. Um, you might have heard this phrase, um, you know, working backwards from the from the customer. Um, I, I think that's one thing that often in IT um, 
we focus on delivering the technology and not sometimes delivering the business benefits of that technology. And, you know, it's been a big area for a long time. How do we align technology strategy with the business strategy? And what we're starting to see is organisations that are tearing apart their centralised IT department and devolving those IT capabilities down into these cross-functional, multifunctional teams inside uh, divisions and various, you know, sub-departments of the business because they want to get that technology capability closer to the business. So they're slimming down their central IT as much as possible and devoting those technology resources uh, into the lines of business. But really what we've found in our experience over seven and a half years is leadership is absolutely key. You know, if you've ever uh, read Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, um, you, can, you can get a short version of it on, on, on YouTube. And, you know, he talks about the importance of, of the vision, the importance of why, the importance of setting the goal. You know, the, the key thing about having, you know, a clear vision, you know, broken down into sort of customer driven objectives to aim for and then with operable metrics to uh, to provide feedback is that it helps give us this um, um, uh, alignment um, and this uh, tension between alignment and autonomy. Um, the work of, of, of um, Dan Pink, if you've read the book Drive, again, highly recommended. Um, he talks about um, the key to high performing team being three things, autonomy, mastery and purpose. So really the, 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 the function of modern leadership is to define what the purpose is to provide the autonomy, but with the alignment that the organization needs. And mastery is this culture of continuous learning. How do you give your teams the opportunity to master their skills, master their domains? Are you giving them enough time to learn uh, these new technologies, these new ways of working? Um, but let's just drill down into, you know, moving away from this command and control world and talking about alignment and autonomy. So if we put this on a on a two by two grid um, and anything can be put on a two by two grid, um, if you have n no autonomy and no alignment, uh, you just have confusion. Nobody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I'm waiting here to be told what to do, but nobody's telling me what to do. Um, I'm not going to go and do my own thing because being spot being um, uh, proactive is uh, not rewarded, in fact, actively discouraged inside our organisation. So I'm just going to sit here uh, waiting for somebody to tell me what to do. I'm confused. If you have an organisation that, um, uh, that has um, uh, high alignment, so uh, a very strong vision, very strong command and control culture, but very little autonomy, effectively you're working working in a tyranny you know my my way or the highway we're going to do it this way there's no choice you will do exactly what you're told to do to, no deviation uh, this is the kind of manager who is uh, expecting their staff to be on a seven hour long zoom call uh, during COVID-19 working or another manager we heard about that was um, having a, a, a five minute check in every hour to see uh, what what his team was doing um, you know, there's no autonomy. And th this way of working assumes that those managers and the people at the top of the hierarchy have a clear, you know, uh, a clear understanding of everything the customer needs. And everything we've learned in the last 30 years of management science actually shows that the people on the coal face who are dealing with the customers have a re much better understanding. So you've got to empower them to give them some autonomy. But if they don't have any direction on what we're supposed to be doing, but they've got lots of autonomy, we have chaos. Um, if you've ever taken your kids to, uh, to, to play sport when they're younger, you know, um, football, soccer um, is the one that springs to mind, you'll find that you'll have just, you know, a whole bunch of kids running after the ball. Uh, there's not a lot of strategy when they're younger. It is chaos. Everybody's just chasing the ball and wants to kick the ball. You know, what we're after is this harmony of, 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 uh, having a clear vision of what you want that is shared and understood by everybody in the organization, the management team setting the why and then the um, the how and the what being delivered by these autonomous teams. And you can get this through, you know, this kind of cascade from, you know, vision, mission, objectives uh, and, and then or outcomes um, rather than outputs. 
uh, objectives and key results. Um, so this framework of objectives and key results, OKRs, is actually used by Microsoft. Um, it's used by Intel. It's used by Google. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research. Um, uh, there's a book by John Doerr, uh, D-O-E-R-R, -R, uh, formerly of Intel, um, and he writes in a lot of details about, uh, about the OKR process. But effectively, it's this idea that you know, at the organization level, we set some objectives and a couple of key metrics. And it's really important, again, to, to talk about trust inside the organization. We'll talk about that in a minute when we come to um, 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 psychological safety. But, you know, it's really, really key that when you're setting the objective, you're not just setting the objective, you're saying, how am I going to measure when we've achieved that objective? Because otherwise, just setting the objective without the key results leaves you open to accusations of moving the goalpost. It's not actually clear by saying, how do we know when we've achieved an objective? You're not setting a great objective if you're not telling people how they're going to achieve their objective. But anyway, you break this down into a cascade from an organization level to a team level to an individual level, and everybody should be feeding up their own objectives through into this lens. And it's a great way to say, why are you doing this thing? Show me how this thing that you're doing aligns with our organizational objective. And it's a great way to get rid of those uh, sort of um, pet projects that many management leaders have that waste millions and millions in large enterprise organizations or waste millions and millions in startups as well who also suffer from the uh, pet project syndrome. How is this aligning with the goals that we as an organization have set that are aligned to our customer is we're working back from, from the customer and then you can then bring this down in a, um, into your actual sprint cycle so you know you would break your okrs down into epics you'd break break your epics down into your agile user stories then you'd um, uh, pull that into your sprint iterations okay so we've got our leadership leading which is a big if um, we've got all our okrs aligned how are we gonna um, actually deliver so the organization pillar, how do we move um, from temporary assemblages of people to deliver projects to our long lived product aligned model? Well, the first thing I think we talk about here is the ecosystem. There is no doubt that the, the boundary between what's done in house and what's done externally is um, uh, becoming very variable, very permeable. So the type of relationships that we have with our vendors, um, partners like Microsoft and, and our customers, you know, we want customers inside the, the, the tent giving us ideas, telling us about the stuff that we're doing and giving us feedback. But we also know that we don't necessarily have all the skills and all the capabilities. So we've got to be able to work really seamlessly with vendors. And this is not your old school large scale outsourcing. Um, there's again a whole body of research that talks about how that is very detrimental to achieving um, the outcomes. But what we are seeing is um, what's kind of called, called capacity based sourcing, which is sort of saying, hey, you know, we want a team that has these capabilities, certain software capabilities, certain operational capabilities. We're going to bring the ideas. Our product manager is going to come and work with your team exactly the same way as they would work with an internal team um, and and we're going to achieve great things together so building out this this ecosystem around this concept of long-lived products not transient projects um, and the key about a product is it's understanding that a product has a product life cycle from inception to retirement and we have to manage that entire life cycle of the product uh, and we need to fund that life cycle with, a, with a, an agilely funded product portfolio. And, you know, this needs to be owned by multidisciplinary teams, dev and ops working together um, to everything they need to do to build and run. So we talk about one of these teams. What does one of these teams look like? Kind of looks a bit like this. So, you know, again, coming back to this autonomy, you know, the role of the product owner or the product manager, there's a subtle difference there, but we don't really have time to go into it. But the the, the key here is, is that the team is working off a well-defined, well-structured backlog of work. They have all the skills they need to build it, deploy it to production, and then either run it on their own, if you're using the Amazon, you build it, you run it model, or 
to work closely with uh, site reliability engineering capability, SRE capability for using the Google model. But even under the Google model, some, somewhere around five to 10% of all the operational incident where it still comes back to this multi multifunctional delivery teams. You can't have a team that doesn't have the ability to debug, test um, and troubleshoot and resolve issues in production because you are absolutely expected to 100% of the time in the Google in the um, AWS model and maybe five to 10% of the time in the um, uh, in the Google model you're expected to do live site incident inside your team so it's absolutely critical that you have both dev and ops capabilities embedded in these teams and really one of the key messages that's come out of DevOps is that user features are only part of the story. Operability stories, talking about deployability, scalability, testability, are as important. You know, there is so much in the operability phrase uh, section that we need to focus on. We need to, you know, there's no point in deploying an application that doesn't work, it isn't stable, it isn't secure, it isn't um, highly performant, it's not cost effective. All of these operability stories are first class citizens in a DevOps model in exactly the same way as, uh, as a, a feature story is. And one of the, the biggest challenges to product managers is to balance out the operability user stories with the, um, uh, the feature user stories. There's always this clamor for new feature, new feature, new feature. And I always think about this as a, you know, COVID, COVID specific, but I mean, what's the point in um, if you're a physical retailer uh, having a massive marketing campaign to drive everybody to come to your store uh, and then the store is shut, locked shut? You know, it's a bit pointless. And that's kind of what operability is like. Operability is shutting the door in the face of your customer because the usability is poor, because the performance is poor, because it's unreliable, it's offline. I, I, I can't maintain it. I can't um, uh, release new features into it. You know, it, it's absolutely critical to balance user features and operability because only through the combination of those two things will you achieve a great customer outcome. So, you know, um, uh, underneath uh, this, we have this concept of, of, of platform teams. And, you know, in the AWS model, they did have this, this idea of you build it, you run it. Um, and what that led to was a lot of fragmentation in systems. And, and even in AWS, they're moving towards having uh, a more common set of tooling now. Uh, and a more common set of, of self-service. The Google SRE model is absolutely driven by, um, by this idea of having this shared platforms, um, self-service platforms that provide delivery teams um, with all of the uh, capabilities that they need to both build, deploy and run um, uh, the service in production. Um, and a lot of this is driven around this idea of um, um, of open source, or so I should say inner source, enterprise shared source, whatever you want to call it. This idea here that you will um, have lots of uh, shared templates, lots of repos, lots of, you know, puppet uh, playbooks, chef recipes, um, whatever you want to, you want to have Terraform um, files, you know, you are setting out a set of best practice, but it's absolutely critical here that this is not a centralized team, um, uh, totally controlling everything that you do. There is a dialogue here uh, in exactly the same way the maintainers of an open source project would have a dialogue with the people who are contributors to that open source project. You know, anybody is open to send a pull request to say, actually, I think I've got a better pattern for, you know, uh, this Ansible playbook or this, this puppet playbook. You know, um, I've got a slightly better way of doing this. Maybe I'm going to store secrets a little bit better. I'm going to use store secret and HashiCorp bolts. You know, submit that as a pull request. And I think it's a real challenge to those people who are maintaining and delivering these shared platforms is you you've got to be open to ideas you've got to have this you've got to be like the maintainers of an open source project who are constantly seeking contributions from other people and have set very clear guidelines on how you're going to contribute which kind of you know um which kind of segues um you know really nicely actually into into talking about culture and you know if there's one constant that we see 
the organizations that embrace change not fighting against it are those organizations who are succeeding in the marketplace and who are adopting now this is not change for change sake. remember we come right back to that strategy we've set we've got some metrics and we're going to run some experiments and we're going to learn but you know change has to be directive and heading in the right direction it's not change for change sake it's change that is enable us to learn new things to achieve those objectives which have been derived from our customer requirements but absolutely key in here is um is the concept of psychological safety um, if you look up dr amy edmondson and google's project aristotle um, when you um, when you have a look at um, uh, at the importance of psychological safety, and in fact, um, uh, Satya Nadella's keynote at um, Ignite last week, uh, he talked about some um, tech intensity, and uh, the equation that he put on screen for tech intensity was I don't know uh, tech capability times something in brackets to the power of trust. So. I was really struck by that because what he's really saying is if you're going to invest in anything inside your organization, investing in new technology capabilities and rates of software development, that'll get you a, a linear increase. If you, if you invest in trust, if you invest, invest in psychological safety, you will actually get an exponential increase in, in the performance of your teams. But yeah, Project Aristotle, uh, Google's research into high performing teams found that the, the number one contributor of high performing teams for psychological safety, um, the ability uh, for interpersonal risk taking basically is what it says. But, um, um, you know, uh, and also the key in here, which you talked about is you know, encouraging continuous learning and promoting personal and team autonomy uh, to accelerate decision making. And, you know, the whole area of culture, you know, is such a huge topic. I have multiple other presentations that just talk about culture, but I just want to leave you with one one image as to why culture is important, um, which is which is this one. You know, culture is that stuff that's it's an iceberg. It's that stuff that's below the waterline. Your strategy and tactics will only get you some so far. But, you know, if you think about it, that's the captain of the Titanic, you know, really going along with his strategy and tactics to beat the uh, beat the record from Liverpool to New York. Uh, and then he hit the, uh, the the part below the waterline of the uh, of, of the culture iceberg. You know, culture will stop your transformation dead. You know, so you absolutely have to understand the culture. You um, you have to understand why people resist change. Uh, and then you have to devise uh, ways to make people want to come on this journey. Um, I really like the story uh, one of my team came up with, which you know goes straight back to that importance of great leadership. And he said, when you're you know articulating, we're going to go on this journey of transformation, whether it's digital transformation or DevOps transformation inside the IT department. We're going to go on this journey and um, I need you to get on the bus or get off the bus and, and that's fine it's your choice get on the bus i'm going to give you the training i'm going to give you the learnings i'm going to support you with all the resources you need to make this journey a successful trip for you me everybody and our customers or you get off the bus and here's your severance package thank you very much for your service goodbye it's pretty stark but it's pretty accurate but the commitment to psychological safety is that commitment that nobody's going to end up underneath the bus. I'm not going to drive the bus over people. I'm not going to think, but I'm going to give people a choice and you've got to choose on the bus or off the bus, your choice. But my commitment to you as a leader is I'm not going to throw you under the bus, which I thought was a really pragmatic and practical analogy that sort of people can understand. And this psychological safety is this shared belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. What that means, interpersonal risk taking, it means I'm doing something new now. I am learning uh, Git for the first time. I'm an operations person. I've never used source control before. I'm going to use Git. I don't really know how to use Git. I'm doing something new. I'm doing something novel. I'm either going to go and try and learn it all in my own time um, and absolutely not tell anybody because I have this fear of failure or feel uh, people are going to laugh because I don't know Git and they already know it. 
in a team that has psychological safety, it's that openness to say, hey, I don't know how to do this. This is something new to me. Who's going to help me? Who's going to help me learn? Who's going to encourage me and support me as I go on this learning journey? And, uh, and that is you know, absolutely critical. And interestingly, when we look at some um, Eric Reese in the Lean Startup Model, he talks about this build, measure, learn loop. You know, learning's not only about the acquisition of new skills, it's also learning about what works. It's learning about our customers. It's learning about why are our products being successful? What features are the customers using? Learning about the performance of our applications. We can learn in many, many different, um, different dimensions. Um, you know, but the key here is is to try and learn as quickly as possible and as low cost as possible. And and there's lots we can do to reduce the, the reduce the level of risk. I mean, it's absolutely key here to make small incremental risks rather than one big risk. People often refer to this as reducing the blast radius. How do I make the blast radius of my transformation smaller? Um, but again, you know. Uh, when we sort of talk about um, um, autonomy on behalf of the teams to do this experimenting, explore these new services ideas, you know, coming back to this idea of alignment and autonomy, you know, want to be up in that top right corner. I've got clear vision that everybody's aligned behind with clear metrics to measure success. That's the why, but the how and the what, exactly which technologies you're using, exactly uh, how you go about solving those problems. That's for the team to work out. That's for the team to decide within the guardrails that you uh, that you provide. So that build, measure, learn loop that we showed a minute ago um, is inherently agile and iterative. It's built into the cycle, which leads us on to our next pillar, which is the ways of working, uh, often referred to as WOW. Um, there are a number of organisations who are going through, you know, having WOW initiatives inside their organisation. And really, um, we want to focus on a couple of things here. You know, we want to focus on this idea of systems thinking. We want to focus on this idea of the end to end flow of work, going back to that model we showed before about, you know, the handovers and teams. We want to focus on the end to end flow of work. You know, um, the, um, uh, the guy called Goldratt in the theory of constraints said, um, you know, any improvement not made at the point of constraint is an illusion. Um, so, you know, um, it's super, super, super important to um, uh, to think about the impact. Again, one of the other measures of DevOps is caring about those people upstream and those people downstream, because it's only by the entire value stream uh, approach to thinking that we're actually going to deliver great value for our customers and we've got to care about the quality of what we do and how it's going to impact people upstream and downstream to us. We're going to leverage lean IT principles, we're going to do continuous delivery of values with agile methods. Um, let's just talk a little bit of, about lean. Um, these are the um, uh, um, uh, lean software development uh, um, um, which is, you know, a great read. I actually have it on the floor here somewhere. But um, this is, um, I think, Tom and Mary Pendiex's book, um, and talk about, you know, lean, uh, the seven wastes of lean, as opposed to, uh, sorry, as um, implemented in um, uh, technology and software development. You know, partially completed work that never gets shipped, waste. You know, is 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 waste. Uh, Features nobody ever, ever uses waste. Refactoring and relearning, sometimes waste, sometimes not. Um, um, but, um, you know, unnecessary handoffs, stuck in queues, switching back and forth between many, many tasks and not being able to, um, um, to get into a flow state of working, you know, and defects, you know, just ha having too many defects that require you to go back and rework and rework and rework. You know, the the people focus a lot on 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 projects. The the biggest area of waste in IT is projects that never complete, or projects that complete but that don't deliver the value. So the biggest way you can save money in your organisation is killing those projects that should never have been started, and killing those projects that are never going to complete, and focus your efforts on the stuff that's actually going to hopefully a smaller project that's actually going to deliver value. I'm conscious of time, we've got seven minutes left, so I'm going to have to pick up the pace. But um, 
somebody asked the question earlier about agile you know it doesn't really matter which flavor of agile you use uh, the bcs devops uh, so the bc agile foundation that that we teach um, is an agnostic approach to uh, to agile which is really based around the values is the um, around the agile manifesto um, which is really key you know we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it through this work we have come to value individuals and interactions over process and tools customer collaboration over contract negotiation working software over comprehensive documentation responding to change over following a plan which is say while there is value on the items in the right i absolutely expect you to deliver great documentation um, you know at some time you're going to have to do contract negotiation it's really important to have a roadmap or a high level plan and you know processes and tools are important it's not as important as the individuals the working software the customer collaboration and the responding to change so jumping into our last pillar the technology pillar um, you know we are obviously by the nature of our company you know huge fans of the cloud um, can you do devops in on-premise environments yes you can um, because you don't forget five pillars of our model 80 percent of them don't talk about the technology um, but it is far easier uh, to uh, implement the kind of self-service platforms and the kind of everything is code automation um, when you're doing a uh, doing it in a cloud environment when you have access effectively to an API that you can use to provision technology resources and there's plenty of people you know who provide that kind of technology on on premise but um, I think cloud adoption is now pretty much mainstream um, when we look at the statistics around cloud you know 6x the amount of spending on clouds compared to general IT although overall the mo at the moment still over 80% I think it's about 84% of um, of spending is still actually spent on on-premise IT. You know, uh, total cloud market expected to be in 178 billion. Um, you know, these numbers are only going in one direction. Um, and so, if you're not starting your cloud adoption, you know, hey, come and give us a call. Or you want to accelerate your cloud adoption? 27%, uh, the highest uh, single risk said the significant challenge to the cloud adoption was lack of resources and expertise. Uh, we're actually doing a, a large scale cloud academy, fully immersive learning environment for a, a public sector customer right now. Super excited about that. Um, but, you know, when we, and in fact, this is actually one of the training materials from the course, but, um, you know, it's absolutely critical, those characteristics of, 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 of cloud. When we look at those high performers of, of DevOps, they are much more likely to have adopted all of the characteristics of um, of cloud. I think you're about 40% more likely to be a high performer if you'd adopted all five characteristics of, of, of cloud. Um, a lot of advantages in cloud. Um, four phases of cloud adoption, very quickly, it tends to be opportunistic. They tend to um, then move to a cloud first model. Then you want to get rid of your data centers. So you jump into an all, all in, get everything out of the data center as quickly as possible. And then you tend to do a whole bunch of refactoring in cloud native. We have our little cloud model about different pathways to get to the cloud. There's the lift and shift super highway. There's uh, the, the middle path that we strongly recommend is which is to adopt DevOps technologies as part of your cloud adoption. It's a great place to introduce these cloud technologies. And then there's the road less traveled uh, of go native rewrites. But, you know, absolutely, you know, you don't want to stay in the IaaS boom town forever. You want to try and whether it's by going straight to doing DevOps as part of your cloud adoption or whether it's by going on that refactor road um, to use immutable infrastructures, containers, leveraging platform as a service, and then ultimately building those cloud platforms that you need to, uh, you know, do some rewrite. But yeah, absolutely, we would say go down this. There's lots of guidance here on um, cloud adoption frameworks. This is the cloud adoption framework for Azure. Um, there is a, an Azure well-architected framework, which also has five pillars, funnily enough, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance, efficiency, cost optimization. Uh, and again, you know, 
there is so much guidance out there on, on and so much support from vendors again part of that ecosystem of vendors that we talked about before uh, to help you on this journey um, it's a it's a it's a well understood pathway now and uh, I urge you to, uh, to get started again building these DevOps platforms this idea of this self-service capability is absolutely key we're going to be building CI CD pipelines uh, whether that's in, in in Azure DevOps or whether that's in github you know the the capabilities uh, that are in github now uh, and the capabilities that are growing inside github there's new operational capabilities coming soon you know there's just fantastic tooling landscapes uh, that are available uh, available to you finish building this slide currently in development and you know when we talk about infrastructure as code and automation we're talking about um, sort of infrastructure as code configuration as code policy as code code pipelines orchestration with kubernetes event driven automation there's so much we can do so very quickly to summarize in the minute or so we've got left software drives business success devops drives great software five pillars of adaptive IT. If you want to get in touch uh, with us, uh, book a free Azure architecture review if you're already in Azure. If you'd like a version of this talk to be given to your internal teams, please come and contact us on those links below. We'll post them into the chat for you. If you want to learn more about um, um, DevOps in general for the Microsoft guidance available on, on the Learn platform, um, please go to Learn TV uh, on the link below. And finally, we would love to get some feedback uh, on the survey code 11678 on aka ms reactor slash survey again we'll post these into the chat um, and finally there's lots more content coming from uh, from reactor uh, follow all of their just on the channel and of course if you want to get in touch with us at devops group please do uh, team at devops group.com um, or any of those links which we have so I think that's absolutely uh, <laughs> a bang on 11 o'clock. Uh, so I'm sorry I didn't have time to uh, to drill down into uh, into too many more questions. I think some of the questions have been asked uh, throughout the uh, chat. Who was it that wrote Drive? Was Dan Pink? Um, um, yep, um, uh, it's a very, very good book. Uh, are there any good DevOps books? Uh, yes, Accelerate. Um, by Nicole Forsgren, uh, Jez Humble, Jean Kim, uh, The Phoenix Project, which is the sort of seminal knowledge uh, a book of DevOps by um, Jean Kim, um, George Spafford, and um, Mr. Bear, who's in BEHR, um, would definitely think. I definitely would go with uh, Lean Enterprise by Jean Humble or Lean Somewhere, Lean Software Development by the Pendiex. Um, what else is there? Uh, Make Work Visible by Dominica de Grandis. Make Work Visible is also a really, really um, um, great book. So yeah, who were the they that were saying this about developer velocity? So that was re research conducted by McKinsey uh, in partnership with, um, uh, with Microsoft. Yeah, I think that's quickly answered all of the, all of the questions. Yeah, as I said, if you can, please, um, um, uh, you know, please, Give some feedback on uh, aka.ms survey 11678 and um, go and uh, further your DevOps journey with the training and it is available on learn.microsoft.com and learn.tv, which is constantly streaming new content. Thank you, uh, Emma. I guess that's a wrap. Yeah, perfect timing, Steve. Um, thank you so much for delivering today's session. Um, and I think there were some great takeaways from it. And um, I'm sure our community members felt it was a great value too. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending, for all of your questions. I've just posted again some of the links in the chat. Um, so for our Learn TV platform and also the survey details are there too. So we'd really appreciate if um, you give us some feedback from today's session. Um, Steve, it was great to have you. Hope to have you back again soon on the reactor and delivering another session. And um, yeah, I guess enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Any follow up questions? you can reach out on, on our meetup group. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody.